Brian from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. This week marks the 20th anniversary of the 1998 King of the Ring. I know that you have stated in the past that the 93 King of the Ring is your favorite, but what do you think about the 98 show? The 98 King of the Ring is probably my second favorite, actually, now that you mention that. Uh, and that's not because there were like a ton of great matches, but there was enough memorable stuff on that show where when I think back to it, I'd probably put that right behind 93 on my list. Uh, but Brian's right, Thursday, this past Thursday, was the 20th anniversary of the night that The Undertaker tossed mankind off the top of the hell in a cell. I, I still remember watching that live. I was watching it. My father was home, and uh, so he was watching it uh, as well. And when that spot happened, we were just just stunned. And it was so early in the match, too. It wasn't even like it like was building to some big climactic spot. Not even five minutes in, three minutes in, boom, the guy's dead. <laughs> it just came out of nowhere. As I'm sure he literally came out of nowhere. If you were one of the Spanish announcers down below, this guy just came out of nowhere. Um, but I just watched the match again. Because I knew it was pointed out to me that it was the 20th anniversary. I said, you know, I haven't watched the match in full. You know, from start to finish. I haven't watched it in years. So I went back and I watched it. And the thing about this match is there is a feeling of excitement after he gets tossed off the cell. Right around the time that he goes to climb back up. There is a certain excitement because... A, it's like nothing I've ever seen before. And B, I don't know what's going to happen next. I had no idea what was going to happen. How do you top that? You've thrown somebody off the top of the cell. What can you possibly do to top that? And they're going back up. And that was the thing. That, to me, is one of the great moments of that match. Is when Foley shrugs off the doctors and the referees and Terry Funk. And he has a separated shoulder. His shoulder is legit fucked. And he is climbing back up the cell. Undertaker had started to climb down on the opposite side. He had to sort of hold up a little bit. <laughs> he was waiting for Foley to come back. So he's just sort of hanging out on the side of the cage. Undertaker's ankle is jacked because he had injured it. Uh, so his ankle is jacked. Foley's shoulder is jacked. Now they're climbing back up. You've got Jim Ross, the greatest of all time on commentary. Uh, this is his greatest you know, performance as far as commentary goes. I mean, his commentary bits from this match are used in so many sports parodies and videos on YouTube, and and it's just comical. You know, the way that I look at Bobby Heenan's commentary performance at the 92 Rumble as being his best, well, this was the best of Jim Ross. And Jim Ross has talked about the fact that he didn't like to really know what was going to happen in advance uh, when it came to these matches. So him and King had no idea. They did not know that Foley was going to be coming off the top of the cage. They didn't know he was going through the cage. They didn't know anything. And JR got him his job. I mean, he got Foley a job in the company. So he was very close to Mick. I'm sure he was very uh, emotional after he saw him go flying off the, the cage the first time. Now he's climbing back up. And you hear JR on comment, oh, he's going back up. You know, mankind is going back up. And the fans are just... There's like buzzing in the crowd. It was exciting. It was scary, but it was exciting because you didn't know what was going to happen next. And I listened to the podcast or, or part of the podcast that Conrad just did with Bruce Pritchard. Talking about the 98 King of the Ring and more specifically talking about this match. And I know Pritchard, you know, for all the stuff that's true, he also tells tall tales. He has his version of events. Yes, he was there. We weren't. But that's like saying on Eric Bischoff's podcast, well, Eric Bischoff was there and we weren't, so you have to take everything Eric Bischoff says for gospel. Eric Bischoff is a promoter who has his point of view on the way things were. And Eric Bischoff, I'm sure for all the truths that he tells, is also full of shit on a lot of other things. And Pritchard is no different. Pritchard has his version of events on things, but he also tends to sometimes talk about things where you listen to it and you go... That's not right. That doesn't sound... I'm not just talking about, like, wrong dates and stuff. Like, sometimes things are said that just make you sit there and go, this guy is full of shit. Or he's carrying the water for Vince McMahon still after all these years. Uh, so you get, a mix, you get a mix of all those things. But I do believe him on this. He confirmed something that Mick Foley, I believe in his book, had always denied. Which is that the second cell spot 
after they climbed back up and Foley got chokeslammed through the cage. That was something that was planned in advance. And I know some of you may be listening to this going, well, isn't that obvious, Solomos? You're not really breaking any new news here. I thought it was obvious, but again, Foley himself and other people have always said, well, you know, the first spot was planned, but the second one, he wasn't supposed to go through. And I always used to hear that and go, you're full of shit. Mick Foley, I love you, but you're full of shit. Let's think about this logically. Mick Foley just got tossed off the roof of the cage. He then climbs back up onto the roof. There was no way he was coming back down in anything but a violent manner. <laughs> they were not going to agree to disagree with one another, shake hands like gentlemen, and gently climb back down. They went back up there for a reason. That's number one. Number two, I get that Foley was all disoriented. He had, uh, like I said, the dislocated shoulder. But he took one of the worst-looking choke slams that you will ever see. It was more like a shove. It looked like Undertaker shoved him backwards, not like he choke slammed him. And I've always watched that and thought he was braced or bracing himself to go through the cage. Otherwise, it just comes off looking awful. And it seems like if Pritchard is to be believed here, the truth may actually be somewhere in the middle, and maybe Foley was just sort of bending the truth and not really lying per se. Pritchard says the plan was for Undertaker to choke slam Foley on that panel three times. And each of the first two times, it would give a little bit more, and it would give a little bit more. And by the third one, hopefully, he says hopefully, because how do you, how do you even prepare for something? You hope it breaks on the third one, but they had no guarantee it was going to break on the third one. The hope was that by the third one, it would break. And I guess maybe Foley would, like, hang there. He wouldn't just go straight through, but the panel would break, and Foley maybe would hang but ultimately, he would fall. It just wouldn't be quite the same distance, and maybe the, the fall wouldn't be quite as violent, but he would fall from the top of the cage, and he would land in the middle of the ring. If that's true, and that's the first I'm hearing of that, but if that's the case, Foley would not be lying if he said that the spot, as it happened, was not planned that way. But the insinuation that that wasn't a plan, that, that any kind of fall wasn't planned, which is how I always read it, I never bought that for a second. I thought, well, dude, come on. It's obvious that something was planned and you were going to go through the, the, the cage. Um, I'm sure that, I know the chair falling and hitting him in the face was absolutely not planned. That, I believe. Foley's actually said the worst part of that bump wasn't even landing in the ring. It was the chair hitting him in the face on the way down. Um, but they absolutely knew he was going through that roof in some form or fashion when they went back up there. You'll you'll just, you'll never be able to convince me otherwise. Um, the rest of the match... I, I'm watching it again, and I'm thinking to myself, I don't know how this guy was able to continue. And if that happened today, first of all, this match would never happen today. It would never happen. When Foley took the first bump off the cage, he was laying there for what felt like 60 seconds or 90 seconds before anybody even came over to check on him to make sure that he was alive and breathing. Because he was laying there prone. He was not moving. He could have been dead. Not one person came over to check on him. Jim Ross, legit on commentary, had to say, Get off your butt in the back and get somebody out here. Because nobody was coming out. If that happened today, they have a doctor at ringside. People would be, would be out there in 10 seconds. You know that that uh, Charles Robinson sprint to the ring at WrestleMania 24 in Orlando? Where he came down to the ring like the Ultimate Warrior? That'd be him coming down to the ring now. That's the first biggest difference. A, that spot would never be okayed. And B, there'd be people on the spot to make sure this guy had a pulse. But then to let him go back up. And to go through again. And to let the match continue. It's just, it's unbelievable. Things have changed so much that it's jarring now to go back and watch a match like this and watch all of this happening and think, how how is this ever allowed? How is this okay? I, I felt guilty watching this. Now, thank God, Foley seems to be okay. All things considered, Foley still has his faculties about him. He's a very bright, very articulate person. And he's going on tours, and he's being very active. But he's also, you know, he's still a relatively young guy. I'm still very worried about what Mick Foley is going to look like in 10 years. Uh, I think a lot of people are worried about that. I'm sure his own family is worried about that. But you try not to think about it, because what's done is done, right? You can't undo, you can't undo the damage. You take risks. You weigh the pros and cons of those risks. Foley's career was one giant risk. 
And it paid off in that, you know, he became a big star and, you know, he's able to support his family and live a comfortable life. You worry, though, at what cost? You watch a match like this and you wonder how many years off his life. How many years came off his life from this one match? You know, and, and I look at this match and I think it's both one of the best and one of the worst matches in WWE history. I can't grade this match the way I would sort of grade other matches. Oh, it was a great match. It wasn't even a match. It was it was just a wild brawl. Um, it, it's hard to judge a match like this. But I'm not going to lie and say it's not exciting to go back and watch all the, the chaos and everything. And it was a crazy fucking match. But it's also one of the worst matches that the company has ever had. Because... You can't top that. And for years after that, I'm sure there were plenty of wrestlers in the company and young young people wanting to grow up to be wrestlers who now are, who watched that and said, man, I'm going to have to top that one day. And who knows how many other crazy matches and crazy spots and injuries that that match led to. Um, so it just set the bar so high and it was such a, a, a violent match. And Foley's a nice guy and... and I don't know. I mean, just to see him put himself through that kind of abuse, it's just, it's sickening. It's like the 99 Rumble. It's hard for me to go back and watch the end of that match with him and The Rock. Knowing that The Rock held nothing back. He was waylaying him in the head 12 times with a chair. Guy's all bloody, his arms are tied behind his back, and Rock is not holding anything back. And he is just bashing this guy's brains in with a steel chair. It is uncomfortable to go back and watch stuff like that. And I'm somebody who kind of wishes that, you know, we had blood a little more often in matches and things weren't so buttoned up in PC. But even I have my limits, you know, and I go back and watch that and I'm like, I can't believe this happened. I cannot believe that this was allowed to happen. This company would be kicked off television if they did stuff like that now. It's just the way things have changed. Now, one thing I did learn listening to that Pritchard show, and this I was not aware of, uh, I'm sure many of you remembered uh, Francois Petit, right? He was the guy who came out there with the ponytail to check on Foley. I thought he was a doctor. I don't think he was actually a doctor. Uh, he was a massage therapist. He was a physical therapist. Uh, but I had no idea, and I learned this on that show, that he played Sub-Zero in the first Mortal Kombat movie that came out back in 95. That's pretty wild. So I went up on IMDb, I said, I gotta check this out for myself, and sure enough, I bring up his IMDb profile, and there he is, Francois Petit, he played Sub-Zero in the movie, and his IMDb bio is insane. I, I want to read this to you, because this is just amazing, this guy sounds like an amazing person. It says, Francois is a world-class martial artist from a large family, all skilled in the martial arts. He began his training at age three, under the guidance of Japanese masters, and also studied at the opera. In 1971, he was drafted into the army in Africa where he was wounded. He became a prisoner of war for almost six months and was paralyzed. After his release, he spent five months in the VA hospital and doctors told him he would never walk again. But with his own strength and spirit, he recovered and became a great martial artist, stunt coordinator, and teacher. Francois worked as a trainer and physical therapist for the wrestlers of WWF and taught martial arts at Gold's Gym, in 2004, he moved to Korea to improve his skills. He later moved to Spain, where he still teaches martial arts. That is quite the life to live for uh, Francois Petit. I was not aware of that. As far as the rest of the show goes, because it really, I mean, there was more than just one match on this King of the Ring show. I can remember watching the show and thinking Ken Shamrock and The Rock had a hell of a match in the finals of that tournament. Uh, I remember being disappointed that Shamrock never wore the cape and the crown, which, looking back, would have been ridiculous. And I'm actually happy that uh, young Jason was not uh, in a position to have booking power over, <laughs> over WWE. Uh, maybe today young Jason could actually do some good for WWE, some of the uh, wild ideas he had back then. But, uh, yeah, so I think putting the crown in the robe on Shamrock, who came in as this serious mixed martial arts fighter, they call him the... The world's most dangerous man. That would have been probably about as smart as putting a blonde wig on Goldberg. Uh, I also remember the main event. Now think about this. Stone Cold and Kane had to come back out and follow the Hell in a Cell. They were immediately after that Hell in a Cell match. They had to follow those two guys. 
And they did, only because Austin was so freaking popular back then. He was, I mean, it was insane how over he was. So the crowd was hot for that entire match. Uh, but I remember the main event, Stone Cold had this huge wrap on his elbow. He had a staph infection. Uh, these days we all have to deal with a, uh, a staph infection. But, you know, Austin wrestled this match here with a staph infection in his arm. It was basically half first blood, half hell in a cell. Because somebody lowered the cell halfway into it. And it's a memorable match because it's the one and only time Kane ever won the WWF title. Uh, he lost it the next night, which is the only reason they put the title on him in the first place. They wanted to pop a big number opposite Nitro, and it worked. They did like a 6.0 Nielsen rating or something like that, I remember. Uh, I used to I used to clip out of the newspaper whenever like Raw would do a gigantic monster rating. The TV section of my local newspaper here, the Daily News, would have a little story on it. You know, when they got an 8.0 that one time in May of 99, there was an actual story on that in the newspaper, and I have those clippings every time they would pop a big number. But, uh, so it worked. You know, their their plan worked. Now, beyond the things I just mentioned, I have no recollection of anything else on this show. So, the Shamrock Rock final, the Hell in a Cell, and the austin uh, Kane match with Kane winning the championship, those are the only things I remember from this show. I don't remember anything. Actually, that's not true. I remember Al Snow teaming with head i do remember that beyond that i don't remember a thing and what's crazier if i can go back to the hell in a cell match one more time here what's even crazier about that is for all the abuse that mick foley took it gets forgotten that foley came back out for the main event he did a run-in in in the championship match and i would say it was maybe two weeks two and a half yeah probably about two weeks Two weeks after this match that Foley had, two weeks after this pay-per-view, uh, I got to meet Foley for the very first time. This was the live Raw at the Meadowlands in New Jersey that I won luxury box seats to for my local radio station. I know I've told that story before. Part of the deal was that they would send four wrestlers to each of the luxury boxes in the hour before the show went live on the air. So during all the dark matches, or maybe it was... Uh, I guess it still would have probably been like a Superstars taping back then. They were sending four wrestlers from box to box to have some private time for about 10-15 minutes with the people in the box. So during this hour, they sent Owen Hart, Mankind, Mark Henry, and Luna Vachon. They sent them to our box for autographs and for pictures. And I remember uh, Owen and Mark Henry and Luna, they were all sort of standing around, mingling and signing stuff for people. Foley was sitting. He was sitting down, he was shooting the shit with Owen about talking about their kids and picking their kids up from school and all that kind of stuff as they were signing things. They really weren't even paying attention to us. They were signing, but they were just sort of engaged in this conversation with one another. And I just remember looking at Foley. He was all disheveled. He was wearing the Mankind outfit with the white shirt and everything. He had the mask off. And I just, I'm looking at this guy and I'm thinking, you know, he he just looked how just completely beaten to shit he looked. I remember thinking, man, this guy looks like he's 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 seen some shit. And it wasn't hard to see that he was still very much reeling from the after effects of that Hell in a Cell match. It was only two weeks later. You know, and, and to see him up close like that was something I don't think I'm going to soon forget. And I don't think that's a match that anybody, if you saw it, will ever forget. And for a lot of reasons, I hope we never see another match like that again.